Hi, how are you, Luciana Kemper? Hi, Governor. How are you? So welcome, Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito. I am uh, Elizabeth Deneen. I'm the CEO of the YWCA of Western Mass. We are absolutely thrilled to be able to host you this morning. Also, nice to see you, Secretary Reedy, former prosecutor. Uh, so today we're here to talk about some legislation that the governor and lieutenant governor want to enact. We have some people who are going to be testifying as to why this should be enacted. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, you. Thank you very much, Liz, for having us here uh, once again. I want to thank you and the YWCA for being amazing partners in helping women and people of this community uh, with a number of issues, including seeking a place of safety and support. Uh, you have been a constant champion for women and people uh, who need help, and we thank you for being here for us once again today. Uh, this is a very important issue uh, to us, but most importantly to you, and we want to thank you for being here with us uh, to share your experience. Uh, these are hard experiences, painful experiences that have led to uh, trauma for you, perhaps children, family, people in your life, and, and involving a system that may or may not have been there to help you and support you. And it's the reason why Governor Baker and our team want to make the system work better for people like you and coming forward to share your stories helps us make that case to the legislative body that can change statutes and make things better and safer for people of the Commonwealth. <clears throat> We're here to listen to you and to support you, and we are very grateful that you have the courage and the strength to share your story with us today. Well, good morning, and, and thank you to the Y for hosting us today. And um, I'm not going to talk long because we really are more interested in hearing what you have to say. And what I will say is to echo something the Lieutenant Governor said, which is part of the reason why these loopholes and um, omissions and absurdities exist in our state law is because in many cases it's very hard for people to come forward and to speak about this stuff. So it basically exists and lives in many cases out of sight, under the radar, out of mind. And um, the Lieutenant Governor and I have been deeply frustrated by our inability to get the legislature to understand why this is so important. And um, we've held a series of conversations like this in other parts of the Commonwealth and have discovered that your voices have actually gotten people's attention in a way that over the past seven years we just haven't been able to get there and um, and I know for all of you just reliving these moments and circumstances has to be painful and difficult and there are several other folks who basically chose not to come because they just couldn't do it and um, for us your presence and your words are a critically important part of, of making this case, and and you really do honor us with your presence, and we really appreciate it. If we could start with Commissioner Cheryl Cloudy, um, if you could please uh, recount the facts of the Weldon case, the serial killer. Sure, Liz, and thank you. Thank you for hosting this. Um, we appreciate it. Governor and Lieutenant Governor, thanks so much for your support on this bill and, and how important it is to us. And I know Mayor Sarno and I appreciate your efforts because we're trying to spearhead it all. So we understand and we have met with and we have spoken with the victims of, of violent crimes and where the person should still have been held or been incarcerated and, and things have happened. And one of the most egregious things in Springfield that we dealt with was in February of 2018, and a person named Stuart Weldon, Governor and Lieutenant Governor, Stuart Weldon was uh, placed on a GPS bracelet. 
in February 2018, and his charges were felony charges. He had open felony charges at the time. In defiance of the GPS bracelet, he cut it off on the courthouse steps and left it there. Um, he was not seen again by law enforcement until May of 2019, where we had a traffic stop and we discovered a woman in Stuart Weldon's vehicle who was being held against her will. And thank God the officers stopped that car for a minor traffic violation, which is another pet peeve of mine when they take that tool away from us, but stopped for a minor traffic violation. She was able to go to the officers and say, he's holding me against his will. He has done bad things to women at his house, on the street. I need your help. The two officers um, took her, we took her statement, we arrested Mr. Weldon, and the result of that investigation, we found woman's bodies buried in his home. There was a woman's body tied to a chair still in his cellar, and since his arrest, um, we have on file over 20 women who were sexually assaulted between the time he cut off that bracelet and he was discovered, but I'm sure the number is higher. I'm sure um, upwards of 50 women were sexually assaulted after he cut off the GPS bracelet. And that's uh, my concern here today is um, Stuart Weldon was a candidate for a dangerousness hearing. He is not a candidate for a GPS bracelet. My concern is those who get GPS bracelets, um, I, I understand it for trespassing, shoplifting, first offenses. Um, you want to confine them and know their whereabouts, that's fine. But felons and violent felons do not belong on GPS bracelets. Thank you, Liz. What was the resolution of the Weldon case ultimately? Ultimately, he's um, convicted and, and pled to um, several murders and some of the sexual assaults he had a hard time believe it or not, an easier time pleading to the murders than pleading to the sexual assaults. What's his sentence? Um, I'm not sure, Lieutenant Governor, the exact sentence. He's away for quite a long time. I believe it was life without parole. Life without, life parole. without parole, yeah. yeah. Which, thank God, we, I guess we didn't put him back on a bracelet. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible that these the GPS bracelet is, is being assigned wrong, and the ability of people to follow up when they violate the GPS is also lacking. So definitely not for violent felons. What were the felony charges that were open at the time you presented to the court? In February 2018, Stuart Weldon was out on bail and assigned a GPS tractor, tracker for several charges, including assault with a dangerous weapon. And there was a few others besides that, but there were felonies. And in defiance, he cuts it off on the courthouse steps, which if I found someone's GPS bracelet cut off on the, on the courthouse steps, that's a in-your-face, I'm not going to, and I would have had a little bit more of an effort to, to try to get him. But there's so many people I'm understanding out on GPS bra bracelets that may be overwhelming at this time also. And, and Commissioner, uh, if someone cuts off uh, an ankle bracelet at this time, it is simply a misdemeanor, correct? Correct. So part that, of what this legislation would uh, enact would be... Felony. It would be a felony. We, we want it to be a felony. We want it to be acted on immediately. Yes. And if it was a felony, then the police officers would be more engaged in terms of looking for that particular person. Correct, Liz. Thank you. Yep, correct. I'm going to uh, introduce the next person, uh, who is Dana Parsons. She is the chief of the sexual assault and domestic violence unit at the district attorney's office in Hamden County. And this woman has spent her entire career, just like Cheryl Claproot, advocating on behalf of people who need a strong voice. Yes. Thank you, Liz. Um, Thank you for being here to listen to us. It's so great to have someone from the other side of the state, you know, powerful administration come in to hear um, just these personal stories of everyone. Um, I come to you just to show or to um, share with you some of the 
positive things that have come um, out of the dangerousness statute has been used. Um, there are two cases I want to highlight for you and just to give you an idea of how important and how useful that tool has been for the DA's office, because sometimes we're kind of handcuffed with what we can do. Um, one of the cases I will just refer to, the defendant's name is Dennis. Um, Dennis was charged with um, drugging a young lady for sexual intercourse, as well as aggravated rape. Um, this was a trusted person in her life, but she was an adult. She was approximately 18, 19 years old at the time of the incident. Um, this individual lived across the street from her, um, so it was someone very close, very nearby. Um, she would never feel safe, um, regardless of where he was. Um, Dennis also had the means, through family members, to post pretty high amounts of bail, if we were to ask for bail. However, given the nature of the charges, um, we were able to ask for him to be held as a danger, and that was granted by the court. We were very happy about that. However, even though he was held in the House of Correction, um, he started writing letters, not only to her, but to her family members, their witnesses in the case, um, seriously outlining um, in bullet format all the ways that they could um, get out of this, that they could plead the fifth, that they could go to the court, that they could tell me that they lied, um, and all this influential, intimidating behavior um, that he laid out for them in these letters. Thankfully, which is not often the case, these two brave young ladies came to me, and they brought me the letters. Um, and I was able to reindict him for witness intimidation, threats, violation of restraining order, a whole new slew of cases. Um, and I could add, I'm going to be able to hold him even longer. It strengthens my case even more. Um, so that is, and I'm very pleased and impressed by the, you know, how brave these young ladies were to do that, because so many times I just really get this gut feeling after 15 years of doing this that that happened, but nobody told me. And instead, they, they bought into that fear, and reasonably so, um, felt that the safer route wasn't going to be to trust the stranger, me, that they met, you know, a week ago. It's to be able to kind of go the safe route and, and keep out of their abuser's hands again. Um, I would hate to imagine, if this had been a situation where I wasn't able to use the dangerous statute, that there would be bail set, the family would have posted for him, he would have gone back right across the street from her, and it would have been letters. I don't think it would have been letters at that point. It would have been in your face. It would have been violence. It would have been threats. And she wasn't going to be able to be safe at home. So thankfully, we have places like the YMCA. But I, my, my impressions from these victims is, well, why should our survivors, why do I have to leave? Why do I have to leave my home? Why do I have to do all this? I didn't do anything wrong. And so it's just kind of this difficult situation. And in that scenario, I feel like the dangerous statute was very helpful to us. A second story I'll share with you is a gentleman by the name hey, of Dana, Melvin. Dana, can I yes? ask a question? Of course. Um, would he have been able to, um, to leave after 90 days? So in Superior Court, it's 180 days. Okay. Um, and so he's still... But it's still limited. It's still limited. Um, so we're trying to find ways to expand that in certain um, scenarios. But after 180 days, he is entitled to bail. And well, so... We do, we do. In our bill, you're not entitled to bail. You, you, you basically. Right. Under the 180, there's you, no bail. You just, you basically are held. Correct. Until right. trial. Held without the right to bail. Correct. Right. right. Um, the second scenario I want to explain to you, which I think was another situation where it's helpful in us resolving a case early, it's always easier for us to resolve a case when someone is held than if they're on the street because nobody wants to go back to jail. So there was an individual, a very violent, um, ex-boyfriend, it was hot off the presses, they had broken up, um, and he was losing control over her. She, thankfully, was on the phone with a relative or friend um, from Puerto Rico when she heard a smash, and it was her ex-boyfriend coming through the window. Came through the window, you heard her, her friend heard her yelling, no, 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 and referring to him by name, and then the phone line goes dead. Thankfully, the friend calls, um, calls up to Springfield, um, has police do a well-being check, Police come in and they find her this close to dead. I mean, she has been stabbed in the neck. She has lost m more than half of her blood. She's barely breathing. She barely has a pulse. Um, like the, um, the run sheets, everything was, everyone was preparing for this to be a homicide. There was blood everywhere. Um, and he had fled the scene. He was held as a result of the dangerousness statute. He was charged with armed assault and murder. Um, we were able to resolve that case very quickly in under a year, which I know sounds like a lot, but in our world, on a serious case like that, that's pretty quick. Um, and he resolved the case. He pled guilty. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that the police did a great job, but also that he was held and held quickly. And we were able to separate the victim from the offender to be able to have um, 
you know, a good dialogue with her and her family. She was in such a, she was in months and months and months of rehab. Um, her daughters came to every court date. We spoke with them. They had to teach, the, teach their mother how to eat, how to walk, how to do everything all over again. Um, but because we were able to create that separation and because he knew he wasn't going to be able to get to her anymore, I think that made him kind of throw up his hands and eventually decide to plead. Um, and he was sentenced to uh, 12 to 15 in state prison. So those are just two incidences where I felt that the statute was very helpful to the DA's office. And just circling back to Governor Baker's question, mm -hmm. it certainly would be easier if you didn't have to get to the 180 days, always have that deadline hanging over your head, correct? We would love to be able to try all the cases within that, that quick period. Because the longer the case goes on, the longer it gives the offender time to get to the victim, to get to the victim's family. Right. So the quicker we can do it, but the backlog, I mean, that's just, a, that's for a, a different day, but. Um, but we, Dana, my, my point is that if, if, there, if there's a 90-day limit in district court, uh, you have 90 days to try to get that case resolved. And if there's 180 days that someone is held in a dangerousness hearing um, as a result of it in Superior Court, that gives you only 180 days to get to the resolution. To get it resolved. So, yes. so what the governor's bill is, is trying to do is say that once somebody is held on a dangerousness hearing, they would be held until the case is resolved. But that would be tremendous for us because we're just we're unable to do it. With that TikTok, to, it, it's just too quickly. And they know once they get to that, they'll get bail and they get out. And then the power, the power changes and they have more power than I do. Right. That's so. an important factor. And, and, and just, I just want to highlight it for a second. Uh, again, my name's Terrence Reedy. I'm the uh, Secretary of Public Safety. And I was a prosecutor for 20 years in Worcester in, in Suffolk. Um, and what the governor mentioned under his bill is just once there's a judicial determination that someone's dangerous, they don't stop because being dangerous after 90 days or 180 days. And a lot goes on in court where cases can't be heard in those, those time limits. And that does nothing for survivors, survivors' families, witnesses of crime. Because that offender doesn't all of a sudden become not dangerous after 180 days. It keeps the most violent predators in custody with their victims, with their families, and where the community can be held safer. Uh, it also takes into consideration uh, the defendant's record of convictions. Right now, under, under the current 58A statute, uh, it's what the offense before that judge at arraignment is that opens the door for dangerousness. Under the governor, governor's bill, it's their history of conviction. So they may come into court on something that um, someone may consider a, a lesser charge, but they may have a significant history of violence. Currently in Massachusetts, you can't move for a dangerousness under those circumstances. Under the governor's bill, you can. Um, those are really two really important factors. Another third fact, uh, important factor is there are certain, stat, uh, certain crimes in Massachusetts that a prosecutor's office cannot move for dangerousness on. Statutory rape, indecent assault and battery on, on a juvenile, certain firearm uh, charges, um, assault and battery on a disabled person. Now it's common sense that those are probably the perpetrators of some of the most dangerous people in the Commonwealth. And a district attorney's office cannot move for dangerousness on those individuals. Um, and there are a number of other really important aspects to this, this bill. Um, the highlight for me today, and I, I know I speak for the governor and the lieutenant governor and Liz, uh, is the bravery of the survivors you're going to hear from today. Um, we took part in a roundtable in Plymouth back in December. And, um, and I've handled a lot of serious cases in Suffolk and Worcester, uh, gang crimes, murders, uh, horrible cases. And I told the governor and the lieutenant governor after that roundtable, mm -hmm where we had a number of survivors give their, and you say stories, they're not, they're nightmares. In public, telling what they were um, subjected to, how the system treated them. And I told the governor that in all my years as a prosecutor, and I've had a lot of brave people cooperate with me on cases, it was the most courageous, brave acts that I've ever seen in public with those survivors, given the stories, how the system has failed them. 
and, and you're going to hear similar stories today. And so I just want to thank the three of you for coming here today um, and, and, and shedding a light and, and, and putting a face behind this bill. And, um, and one, of the, one, of, one of the statements from one of the survivors in Plymouth that really stuck with me, um, and I know it, it stuck with the governor and the, and the lieutenant governor was, it's a basic human right to feel safe. Mm -hmm. That says it all. And you're gonna hear how it affects the survivors, witnesses, and their families that sometimes in this day and age are left behind <clears throat> and not focused on in the judicial system. Sometimes it's, it's, it's the survivors, the witnesses, and their families that have to take a back seat. And that's just not right on so many different levels. So I just want to thank you, all three of you, uh, for your courage for coming today. And uh, I, I, I know we all appreciate it. Thank you. Before we go any further, um, I appreciate those comments, Secretary Reedy. I was a prosecutor for 27 years. Um, and uh, dealt primarily with sexual assault, domestic violence, and child murder cases. And I find it absolutely outrageous that a prosecutor cannot move for a dangerousness hearing on any case, every case dealing with a gun, and every single case dealing with indecent assault and battery on a child. Because um, we have a program here, Children Who Witness Violence, where we have four social workers who offer services to children between the ages of 3 and 18 years old. Um, and many of those children and young adults who come here for therapy have been survivors of indecent assault and battery. And they have been harmed, and they will be dealing with the ramifications of that indecent assault and battery for the rest of their lives. So it's as if someone is saying it's not that important. It is important, and children are important, and there should be no uh, discretion. Every prosecutor should have the right to do that. And, Commissioner, I'm sure you would agree with me that any time uh, a defendant has a gun charge, they should, the prosecutors should be able to move for a dangerousness hearing. It must be demoralizing for your police officers to see the revolving door of gun cases where people get arraigned and are back on the street or have a bracelet which they immediately cut off. And it's demoralizing and discouraging for victims of gun charges to go forward. Uh, and realize that um, not every one of those cases can a prosecutor um, move for a dangerousness hearing. It's outrageous. And to follow up on that, this is a request by the prosecution Correct. for a hearing. Right. And the court and the judge has to consider the evidence that the prosecutor puts forward. And the accused also has their rights protected in that hearing. It's a full hearing right. to decide whether or not that individual will be held after mm -hmm. an understanding of the full circumstances of the past and the present circumstances before the court. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sharifa, would you be willing to go next, please? Yes. Good morning, Governor and Lieutenant Thank Governor. You. My Can name you is speak Sharifa. into the microphone? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> My name is Sharifa Forbes. I'm the Director of Homelessness Services and our Workforce Development Program here at the YWCA, and I'm also a survivor of domestic violence. So I'm here today to share my experience with you guys, and I do appreciate you guys coming out to hear us. So on November 15th of 2020, I went to dinner at Longhorn Steakhouse in West Springfield with the father of my children and our two kids. We had recently ended our 11-year relationship, but we tried to remain cordial for the sake of the children. That evening, um, it started off good. Things were going well. Towards the ending of the night, we got into a verbal disagreement, and he became very, very verbally abusive during dinner. Um, there were other guests, um, staff, the kids. He humiliated me, called me out of my name, was very degrading. 
Um, and just to avoid further escalation and humiliation, I just shut down. I began to cry. I gathered my things. I left them there with the kids at dinner, and I went out to sit in my car just to get away from it. I sat in my car for maybe about 15, 20 minutes. I got a phone call from my grandmother, and she had asked me to pick her up some food from Shimmerhorns in Holyoke. So I figured, you know, I'm already out here. I'm going to go ahead and just take the ride. Once they're, they come out, we can go to Holyoke and just grab it and head home. He came out about 15, 20 minutes later. He got in the car. He continued to be verbally abusive. I asked him to stop. The kids were in the back. My kids at the time were four and two. He continued, continued. We took off. Um, when he realized I wasn't heading towards Springfield and I was getting on the highway to go to Holyoke, he became very, very irate. And he said, take me home. And I said, listen, my grandmother called. She asked me to pick her up pick her up food in Holyoke. So we're just going to take the ride to Holyoke. I'm not gonna drive all the way to Springfield and then come back out. He continued to be verbally abusive. He got in my face, he's yelling, he's screaming. This is all the while I'm driving 91 North to Holyoke. I got off on exit 16. I started to drive towards Shimmerhorns. As I'm driving, I turned up the music to kind of drown him out so I couldn't you know, just to avoid further confrontation. I didn't want to hear it anymore. He turned the music down. I told him to stop. I don't want to argue. The kids are in the back. I'm driving. You're in my face. You're making me nervous. This is not safe. I turned the music back up. <sighs> he pulled me by my hair. He drug my head down. I swerved off the road, and he punched me in my face in front of my kids. Immediately, I felt my, my eye swell up, and I felt warmth dripping down my face. I grabbed my bag. Immediately, I wanted to call the cops. He grabbed my phone from my hand, and he jumped out of the car, and he took off running. At that moment, I'm in shock. I didn't know what to do, so I got back on the highway. My main concern was the kids. They're screaming. They're crying. They just witnessed all this. I head home to my mother's. I drop the kids off. I explain to her what happened. She encouraged me to go to the hospital. When I got down to the hospital, I spoke with an advocate there, and I also spoke with a police officer, and I told him I wanted to press charges. But due to the incident taking place in Holyoke, he explained I had to go back to the Holyoke Police Department to press charges. So after leaving the hospital, and this is now around maybe 11, 12, midnight. I go to the police department in Holyoke. I explain what took place. They took pictures. I, um, this happened on a Sunday, so they told me I would have to go to the courthouse the following day in order to get a restraining order. The following day, which was Monday the 16th, I was able, I was granted an emergency straight restraining order, but unfortunately, he has to be served. You know, he, he, he has his rights, he has to be served. It took four times, four attempts for them to serve him before they just granted me a year's restraining order. They were unsuccessful. I went back and, back and forth to court within the matter, within the span of two to three months before actually getting a concrete restraining order for me and my kids. Um, Time had went by, I kept in contact with the DA's office with regards to the case. Um, he had other open cases, but they were still unsuccessful with, you know, arresting him. Finally, um, months later, he was arrested, but he was not held on a dangerousness hearing. So, Sharifa, there was, you had to participate in a dangerousness hearing, and he was let go, correct? He was let go. He was let go. So the aftermath is he's still out there, you know. We have two kids together. Um, my kids, well, my daughter, she had to go through therapy. She's old enough to understand what took place, you know. My son, he wasn't old enough for therapy, you know. Um, 
there's still that sense of fear, you know, getting up, getting your kids out the house for school. You don't know where he is. Um, and the fact that he wasn't held and there was proof, you know, it's very discouraging. <clears throat> very, very discouraging. So I just, I'm hoping my testimony today will help make a change for individuals in the future. One of the things that I, um, I need to say is Sharifa came back to work after this happened. Um, she had her black eye, her face was swollen, she couldn't see out of her eye, but she came to work and her only question to me was, can you tell me exactly where the cameras are on this building? Because I want to park my car in a place where, it, God forbid, if he comes here, it's going to be filmed. And um, I did go to court with her on two of the four times um, just to, to be of support uh, for her. But I did witness how incredibly frustrating it was for her to repeatedly seek a restraining order and repeatedly be told, we can't find him, we can't serve him. And repeatedly, Sharifa was telling the judges and probation officers in Springfield District Court, this is the last <coughs> known address, this is where his mother lives, this is where his um, other family members live. And finally, um, um, I think it was Judge Rook who ended up giving you the year-long restraining yes. order. Um, and then it was so sad after she tried so hard to pursue this um, that he wasn't held. And this is somebody who did have felony convictions on his record um, and, and did cases. have felony warrants. So it was beyond uh, frustrating for her and for all of us here who so deeply respect and admire her work. Amber? Thank Hello. you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for being here, Lieutenant Governor and Governor. Um, my name is Amber Estelle. I am Excuse the- Excuse me, can you speak up just a little bit? Yes, Amber Estelle, <laughs> the Director of Survivor Advocacy and Outreach here at the YWCA. So I oversee the domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, um, human trafficking programs, as, long, as well as our 24-7 bilingual hotline. I'm here to speak um, on behalf of a survivor um, who was not able to come today. You know, as we kind of mentioned before, this is like a very fluid or sensitive situation or topic for many survivors. So, you know, some people are still working on, you know, getting the courage to be able to tell their stories. And then the result of some of their situation causes um, a great amount of fear and worry and anxiety about telling their stories. So I'm just hoping that I can at least, you know, somehow paint the picture, you know, and to give an example of what this survivor experienced. Um, so this specific survivor was um, pregnant by the defendant, who was also the father um, of the unborn child. The defendant demanded that the survivor have an abortion and not have the child. That's just, you know, another way of having power and control over the situation, making it known that they're going to do, you know, what they want them to do and trying to um, remove the survivor from having their own voice in the situation. But at this time, the survivor refused to actually have the, the abortion. She wanted to move forward with the pregnancy and with having the child. So in response to um, that decision that the survivor had, the, the defendant became very upset. Um, he beat her, he continuously punched her in the stomach and also strangled her and threatened to kill her and the unborn child. Um, this survivor did decide to, you know, press charges and move forward with prosecution. There was a dangerousness hearing in this situation. Um, it was at this hearing where the survivor actually learned that the defendant had done this to multiple other people, to multiple other women, and there were prior convictions that she had no idea were even um, something that happened before in the past. Um, the defendant was still held after the dangerousness hearing, but, you know, I can't obviously attest to 
how the survivor felt, you know, internally, physically, and emotionally. But, you know, from what was expressed, she is very anxious, you know, afraid, and has a legitimate fear of what will happen, you know, to her and the baby. Because at this point, you know, after the dangerousness hearing, the survivor did have the baby and did move forward with having the birth of the child. Um, but there is a legitimate fear that, you know, if the case isn't resolved soon and that this defendant is actually released anytime soon, that he will actually follow through with the threats that have been made and actually come to kill her and the unborn child. Even during the time of, you know, the defendant being held, um, he still finds ways to communicate with the survivor to still give her threats, um, have people who are considered, I guess, friends, I use that word loosely, or mutual friends, um, to actually approach her and let her know and remind her, you know, of what's going to happen. He's going to do this to you, to, to you and the child, and just continuously make threats. So there's just an ongoing fear of that, you know, um, even with him being held, there's still legit fear because he has ways to still provide the threats and still, you know, still have that power and control over her while not even physically being in front of her or kind of out in that moment. Um, you know, I can only, you know, think in this situation that it's situations and examples like, you know, had there been, I don't know, the word stricter or harsher, you know, sentences or consequences for what this defendant did before, because as I mentioned, there have been um, multiple other convictions that he had already. So you know, in that moment, things like that are times where someone's life can be saved. You know, had he actually got those consequences or was charged or, you know, given a certain or specific sentencing at that time, you know, it could have possibly saved this woman's life. You know, who am I to say? I don't know. But, you know, in those moments, if, that, if it's taken more seriously, you know, you can put a stop to what someone's doing in that moment to avoid it happening again. Because as of right now, at least for this person and for a lot of um, these abusers, it's just a continuing cycle. It's just a revolving door, them going in, coming out, doing the same thing, going in, coming out, doing the same thing every single time. And it's just putting more women, men, and children, you know, in danger every single time that they're released, um, even though they have these convictions. So... I'm just honored to be able to tell the survivor's story. Hopefully I could put, you know, some type of description or narrative to the situation. Um, and thank you for hearing me. Is her case still pending? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that part of the reason why she doesn't want to be here? I believe so, yes. That is exactly the mm -hmm. reason why she won't come in. Yep. Uh, when I was asked to do this, Governor, um, during the last week I had an opportunity to speak to a number of people who work in Amber's uh, DV and SA unit here, as well as our six safe advocate um, employees, as well as people who work in our shelter. And I asked people, can you give me some stories or introduce me to some people who would be willing to testify? There was no shortage of people willing to tell me stories. And the stories would make your hair stand up in terms of the viciousness of them. But many of the cases are still pending. Um, Governor, the only way people can get admission into our shelter at this point is if they are in imminent danger of physical harm or death. That's our contract with DPH. So our shelter is filled every day. And the minute somebody leaves, we have 10 people who will be begging to get in there. And during the pandemic, we had a full floor of a hotel in Springfield filled throughout the pandemic because we could not house the number of survivors who needed shelter. And many of those women are involved in prosecution of the cases. And it goes right back to what was brought up earlier, is if, if we have a limit on the number of days that someone can be held pretrial in a dangerousness hearing, whether it's 90 days in district court or 180 days in superior court, it's not enough. And people are afraid to come here. And I explained to many of the ladies it's the governor and lieutenant governor who want to pass this legislation. And they said, I don't know who the people in the room are going to be. I don't know who might know somebody who's a reporter I or a cameraman. I totally, get, I totally get that. I totally get it. 
So it's, it's you know, this is real. It's really scary. Look, yes. May I just add uh, just another thought I'm having just from the prosecutor side is um, when it comes time for the trial, it can be used against the victims who've already been victimized so many times. If, if, the, if this woman had come in and testified and you had a good defense attorney, I'm at trial and they're going to, they're going to start getting into it. But you got to go up there. You got to speak to the governor, right? You got to you got to go do that. And it would turn it into this bias and this fabrication and try to spin it as though this was all made up and contrived in an effort to speak to the administration. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but this that 1,000% would happen. And then the case is hurt and it's weakened and there's more of a, re you know, more of a doubt that's put into the jury that they could be let out. And then she's in more danger. So I entirely understand why somebody wouldn't want to come in here for multiple reasons, but that's just the prosecutor and me mm -hmm. seeing that side as well. Yeah. Dugana? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Dugana, and I am the. Can you please speak up? <laughs> I am the um, domestic violence counselor in our community based domestic violence program. Um, I will be sharing a story of a survivor um, who have left the area after receiving services here. Um, Although the survivor knows that she did the right thing by pressing criminal charges against her abuser, um, she's embarrassed of her situation. You know, like many victims of um, DV that we mentioned earlier, they're afraid to come forward and tell their story, and they're afraid of retaliation they will face from the abuser and their friends and family members. Um, for five years, the survivor, um, suffered severe and constant physical, emotional, and sexual abuse at the hands of her former boyfriend. Um, each time that she would have the courage to pursue and obtain an emergency to a nigh restraining order, um, the abuser would convince her, you know, I'm going to change. Um, I didn't mean it. It was my fault. I know I shouldn't have done it. And each time she would stay um, to try to make it work for her family. But the last straw for the survivor was um, an argument, verbal argument they had one day concerning his drinking problem. Um, and the, um, her boyfriend exploded. Um, and when he exploded, he proceeded to beat her in front of her three children. He grabbed her by her hair, pushed her on the kitchen floor, and repeatedly bashed her face on the cement floor. Um, and consequently, she ended up with two black eyes, a chipped tooth, and bruises all over her face. After he did that, he took his belt and began to whip her numerously all over her body. Her nine-year-old son, who was not his biological child, witnessed this. And as a little boy, you know, um, at that age, you're taught what a man is, right? in the um, mind frame, and at that moment he felt that he needed to stand up and intervene and protect his mother. The abuser became even more enraged that the little boy would challenge him, and he punched the little boy in the face and punched him in, in the stomach. Um, the survivor, um, in her bloody um, condition, saw what was happening and tried to get the abuser off her son. Then the abuser turned around and continued to beat her. Um, after a moment when the abuse ceased, um, the survivor left to get some help. She ended up going to the hospital and um, was, I'm sorry, reading this is very, very traumatic um, for the survivor and hearing this is not easy. Um, after her bl brutal beating, um, she, of course, was put in an ambulance and was sent to the hospital, where she stayed for a few days um, after mending her um, assaulted body. Uh, the survivor's family members took her children in. Um, she got out of the hospital and filed a criminal ch charges against the abuser, a felony um, assault and abuse, and a deadly weapon um, due to him using the belt. And she retained, obtained a restraining order um, for a whole year. Um, the first time um, 
the charges of assault and battery was uh, done in a dangerous hearing. The uh, abuser was released. And when she was released, that put the survivor in a constant fear of her life. Um, because the, she couldn't sleep, she couldn't function, um, and she was absolutely terrified that he'd come after her and her children and kill her. Um, because throughout the past, he would tell her numerous times that he would kill her. Um, when the abuser was finally arrested, the prosecutor asked for um, a dangerous hearing and the abuser was held. Um, because this case is still pending, um, the survivor is terrified that he will be released prior to trial and kill her. Um, and of course, the abuser um, would be released again. The uh, survivor still has the fear that he might come after her and kill her. So, Degana, I just want to make sure that, um, that from a factual basis, I think you said that there was a couple times she did take out a 209A, correct? Yes. Okay, and then at one point she did take out charges, assault and battery charges, and did ask, there was no dangerousness hearing, and he was released, correct? Correct. And then he continued to abuse her? Correct. Okay. And then there was an arrest. And then there was an arrest, arrest for this one. Okay. Yes, for this yep. one. Thank you. And, and then held, yep. which yes, is the current status. Uh, the, the case is still pending. Right. He's still held. And he's in, he's held he's at held. the moment. He's held at the moment. The under court. a 90 day. Under a 90 day, but uh, afterwards, um, the, the fear is what will happen to her. Yes. Commissioner, could we just circle back to you? Uh, could you give us any other examples briefly uh, that compel you to advocate for this particular legislation? Sure, Liz. Thank you. And uh, I have many examples, but one that sticks in my mind all the time, September 2019, uh, a suspect is out on, again, a GPS bracelet. His prior charges, open firearm robbery case, um, was still pending, and he's placed on a GPS, commits a home invasion where they lit, lit the homeowner on fire and takes off from that home and cuts off that GPS bracelet, leaves it on 495, the highway, and is currently out of the country. Um, these happen all the time, and Liz mentioned it. What's difficult for me, Governor, Lieutenant Governors, is, is putting out young women and men in uniform, asking them to risk their lives for people they don't know, to do their jobs as best they can, and they're arresting these violent criminal offenders who are shooting at people, who have shot people, who are committing armed robberies with weapons. They do the job, they do it well, they go to court, and they're faced with these same individuals a month or two down the road. And what happens is I'm asking them to do it again, to risk your lives for now arresting somebody who is emboldened by the fact that he's just hit a revolving door. He has committed a serious crime, he's back out on the street, he is not only committing other crimes, but now he's probably a target with my officers and innocent people in the middle of this revolving door. One February 19th, just about not a month ago, a couple weeks ago, um, my firearms investigative unit seized a large capacity firearm inside the home of the suspect who is currently on a GPS ankle bracelet and home confinement for pending firearms cases in Hamden Superior Court. He's convicted of, in, of voluntary manslaughter in 2012 shooting death of someone, and during his incarceration committed an assault and battery on a corrections officer. After his release, Springfield police detectives arrested him again in July of 19 with a loaded capacity firearm. Grand jury indicts him, and the case remains open. He's, he was on the Hamden County's prolific offender list. He was number three wanted. He was released on those charges with conditions he wear a GPS ankle bracelet and home confinement in order to stay away from firearms. When Pena was arrested, the suspect was arrested on these new firearms charges 
The office, the district attorney's office, requested $100,000 bail. The judge ordered him on $5,000 bail. He's back out. So I'm asking the men and women again. Um, I'm sure that within a week or two, we're going to run into him again. He is emboldened. He has committed all these crimes. He is circling back out. As I told the U.S. attorney Rollins last week, I will also tell you, um, yes, violent crime is on the rise. Gun, gun crime is on the rise. And it is my belief that about 10% of people commit 90% of my crime. And we know who they are. They're just not being held. And if there's a revolving door, as you've described, it's very difficult to convince uh, a victim to come forward as a witness and to present to try to hold that person Absolutely. accountable. Absolutely. They give us information. We make the arrest. They see them back out. They're not going to talk to us again. And I don't blame them. Right. There's no trust there. I don't blame them. And, and I just want to circle back. Uh, Amber, you mentioned in the fact scenario that you uh, gave to us, and Dana, you mentioned in um, one of the cases that you recounted, that even when a defendant is held on a dangerousness offense, whether it's 90 or 180 days, very often the intimidation continues from jail. Uh, you said a woman told you friends, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and in your case, the defendant actually sent a script for the victim and the witnesses in, in your particular case to follow so that the charges could be dropped, correct? Absolutely, and what's uh, one thing I didn't mention is the jail calls. I mean, we could spend, I could put 10 full-time people on jail calls because I know every time that there's a domestic violence case, the first or second person, he's gonna call his mom and he's gonna call her. And if he can't get her, he's gonna call her sister, her best friend, and there's going to be some way to get to her because if he can get to her, he can get out. And that, that has proven to be true and they, that is the culture and everybody knows it. You know, and it's the guilt. It's, you're gonna put your man in jail, you're gonna hold your baby daddy in jail like that, mm -hmm. and it becomes on her. And then she has to deal with all that shame, humiliation, trying to protect herself, her family, her children, because she's now a rat on the street. Mm -hmm. So right. creating that distance and, and not allowing that um, is so helpful. I think you guys would all agree. Thank you. Thank you all for coming in and testifying. I think um, that's the end of that for now. Um, <laughs> So I just really want to thank both of you for uh, coming to the Y and for listening and for doing everything that you both do every day on behalf of survivors. Um, and thank you for um, continuing to advocate for this legislation. Let's hope you get to the finish line. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for joining us and for speaking on behalf of several folks um, who, for a bunch of pretty good reasons, couldn't or wouldn't be here. And Chief, I just want to say how much we appreciate your willingness to, to come forward and, and, and to speak today. I mean, somebody who has to ask where the cameras are around the building, um, to step forward and, and, and join us. I appreciate you guys being That's here. That's very special. And for you to not only speak of your own circumstances and then to work here in this organization mm -hmm. to help others that have experienced the pain and trauma of abuse to, to have a, a, a different experience and to help them go forward is very powerful and inspirational to all of us. I want to just, before we close out this portion, I'm sure that as, as advocates, you come to this conversation and say, this is, just makes so much sense to change these laws and to fix this, and why hasn't it happened? And I think that's a, a legitimate question that we all ask. Why hasn't this been affixed and addressed? And part of it, I think, is because we haven't had the voices to come forward and to really explain the, what the problem is. And it's one thing for the governor, lieutenant governor to say, this is the problem. It's a whole other thing to have people that are in the system every single day and that have been impacted to explain why it's a problem. And we are very thankful for your voices. 
and the voice on behalf of others to come forward today to help us explain that to the legislative body. And we certainly hope that the governor will have the opportunity to sign these changes into law. Thank you for being so here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, folks, we're going to transition to the media. Test for the mic. Test one. Josh, you're good. Test test one two, testing one two three four, test test one two. Test test one two, testing one two three four, five six seven eight. Good morning. I want to thank you all uh, from the media for being here today, and, and I want to thank our, our, our speakers today for being here, and Liz and her organization. They do tremendous, tremendous work. Um, at the end of the day, what, what this legislation boils down to is keeping people safe. It's a simple concept, but it's really hard to put into effect in Massachusetts under the current statutes. Um, you heard a number of stories here today. Uh, the overarching concern is safety for the individuals, for their families. I can give you a couple highlights from my career as a prosecutor on cases that wouldn't qualify under the current 58A statute. When I was in the Worcester County DA's office, I prosecuted a, uh, an extremist group member, um, a sovereign citizen movement member uh, that was stopped on a motor vehicle uh, uh, stop uh, in Worcester, he had about 6,000 rounds of ammunition in his car. Didn't have a gun, but he had ammo. And under the current statute, you cannot move for a dangerousness hearing. The police didn't find the gun. Maybe he had it at his house. Maybe he had it somewhere sec secreted. But he had 6,000 rounds of ammunition without a license driving through the streets of Massachusetts. And he's not a dangerous person, and we had to go under traditional bail. Also in Massachusetts, we're seeing, and I know Commissioner Clapford will echo this, we're seeing an increase in large capacity weapons being used at crime scenes. The, the, the amount of casings found at crime scenes in Springfield, in Boston, in Worcester, and throughout this state has gone through the roof. And it's gone through the roof because there are large capacity magazines that fit into uh, firearms. Under the current statute, if you don't find a firearm with the, in, in that magazine attached to the, to, to the firearm, you can't move for a dangerousness hearing. What reason for an individual without a record to have a large capacity magazine and just walking around and having it in his possession? And you can't move for a dangerousness hearing if you don't find the firearm and it's not attached inside the firearm. There are real-world examples, and I encourage you all, if you have an opportunity to look on, on the state website, on the roundtable that took place in Plymouth in, in, in December. And there are additional concrete examples from real people, real citizens, who had suffered with their interactions with the criminal justice system. And 
I know there was some talk uh, today in regards to um, um, individuals not being held on dangerous hearing. Listen, judges every day in this Commonwealth have a really hard job. You know, they're dealing with human trauma. They don't have a crystal ball. But we want to give them the opportunity to at least have a hearing in front of them where they can make a determination based on the evidence, protecting individuals, due process rights, but giving an opportunity when the district attorney's office believes that someone is dangerous and put a hearing in. Sometimes the defense is going to have it go their way. Sometimes the prosecution will have it go their way. That's our system. But at the end of the day, the prosecutors need an opportunity. And I know uh, Mayor uh, Sarno and DA Galuni have been leaders on this topic in Hamden County as well as across the state. And um, I hope the legislature really gives a, a, a strong look at the governor's uh, bill because it, there are loopholes, and those loopholes all have a face. So thank you again for being here. So thanks again for coming out, and I want to thank the commissioner. I want to thank Liz, Dana, and I want to thank the, the folks who spoke. Um, the conclusion I keep coming to when we have these conversations with survivors directly or with people who are representing survivors is whose side are we on? Whose side is the Commonwealth on? We ask women who've gone through a horrible traumatic experience to stand up press charges, and take their chances. But the court system's never going to process this case in 90 days. It's probably not going to process it in 180 days. So if you stand up, you press charges, and you deal with the incoming you're going to get from your abusers, family, friends, neighbors, Maybe even from some of your own friends who will say, what are you doing? Why are you putting yourself at risk? Why are you making this worse? He's going to be out in 90 days. He's going to be out in 180. You won't even be at trial by then. The thing that I took away from every conversation I've ever had with people about this is they don't understand why the scales of justice tip so hard against them. Why they're the ones that have to put themselves, their children, and their families at risk to, quote, do the right thing. Now, we purport in Massachusetts to be a state that will recognize when we have flaws and we'll fix circumstances and situations where we've put victims on the wrong side of the process. We are failing victims here in the Commonwealth over and over and over again. And we've been doing it for years. These aren't scenarios. These aren't made up. They're real stories from real people. And they pay an enormous price because this state hasn't acted not to turn our legal system upside down, but to simply deal with some cracks in the process and to give a victim some confidence that if they go forward, they can sleep at night. They can leave their house. They don't have to, as one of those women spoke to, only park in places where they're sure there are surveillance cameras in case someone attacks them. This isn't rewriting the criminal justice code. This is a very targeted effort 
to deal with very particular real life circumstances that have borne out over and over and over again here in Massachusetts. And I really hope we find a way to get this done for the victims, for their kids, for the system. Because I can't believe the people who work in the court system go to bed at night believing the system's working for the people it should be working for either. Senator Governor? A lot has been said, and the most important statements today were of the advocates and, in particular, the survivor. Uh, just another point to make in the case to fix the dangerous statute is that not too long ago, the bail statute was changed. You can no longer use high bail to hold someone for dangerousness. And when that went away, the, the prosecutors... Away, we signed that. We did sign that. The prosecutor's only tool to call for a dangerousness statute, for a dangerous hearing, is outlined in the statute and has a limited number of triggers to call for the dangerousness hearing. It's a short list. It doesn't account for gun charges. It doesn't account for indecent assault and battery on a child, rape, human trafficking. There is a longer list of offenses that should be available to prosecutors to be able to request a dangerousness hearing. And then for the court to hold the dangerousness hearing consider all of the evidence to make the decision. That's number one. That has to get done. That was a sort of a, a con unintended consequence of changing the bail statute. The other piece that you heard over and over again today and in Plymouth and from others that have presented their stories to us is that the 90 to 180 days is irrelevant from the point of view of a victim and that you need to hold long enough for the case to be decided. Because at the 90th day, that person isn't any better in terms of making it safer for the victim. In fact, I would argue that on that 90th day, on that 180th day, they come out and there's a fury. There's a rage and there's a mission to go back and find the victim and to cause more harm. So we've now set up a set of circumstances that makes it even more difficult for victims and children and families uh, who have not only been inflicted the physical pain of abuse, but also the trauma that never, ever, ever ends in their lives or in the lives and the eyes and the, the feelings of their children. So for those reasons, uh, we, for now, the second time filing this bill before the legislature, request that the time is long overdue for the dangerousness statute to be updated, for these loopholes to be closed, to make it safer for uh, children, victims, individuals, and families of our commonwealth. Questions? I mean, honestly, um, the Lieutenant Governor and I have talked at great length with the Secretary and with many others about, with victim advocacy groups and others, about the difficulty we've had making progress on this. And, um, and I'm perfectly willing to accept some of the blame for the fact that we haven't made a case that's compelling enough to the legislature to move on it. Um, I do think by giving those who represent survivors and the survivors themselves a chance to be heard, recognizing that every time we do this, um, we are asking people to put themselves in a position that they would probably choose not to put themselves in otherwise is difficult and complicated. I mean, the folks in the other forum we had in Plymouth that was mentioned earlier, they all sat with their backs to the audience as well and didn't want to be identified. Um, and I completely understand where they're coming from and how hard it is for them to speak publicly about this. But their, their voices matter. And I really do hope that 
that becomes part of what makes this um, a more compelling issue in a world where there's a lot of compelling issues for the legislature to work through uh, to get this one done in this session. Is it difficult? Yeah. On Beacon Hill. I do think some people think of this as uh, one more excuse to put somebody um, behind the wall who doesn't belong there. Um, but you really have to shorthand and misrepresent what we're talking about to get from where this proposal is to that. We're basically talking about giving the court an opportunity to seek a dangerousness hearing under certain circumstances and to make a decision at that point based on the facts before them. Um, that is hardly um, anything that would fall into the, you know, uh, circumstances of just throwing all kinds of people behind the wall who don't belong there. In fact, this is just the opposite. This is creating a process. This is building on a process that we have already acknowledged as a commonwealth we believe is a good one, the dangerousness process, and applying it more uh, appropriately based on real life experience to circumstances and situations that victims have found themselves in. There's no question that when we talk to survivors and to those who represent them, you get the sense of urgency right away. I mean, some of these people have cases that are currently either before the court or in situations and circumstances where they chose not to press charges because they were concerned about the 90 and the 180 day um, limits to, to any time somebody would spend uh, being held. And I think that's, and, this, and the, <laughs> the other thing, the legislative session ends on July 31st. And, uh, and for us, this really is something that we believe we need to get enacted um, because the session's there, the opportunity is there, the voices have certainly spoke strongly at some significant pain and suffering to themselves about why this is so important. So yes, there's a tremendous amount of urgency in this. So you're hoping that they Yes. Is it well today to bring like the story? Yes. Use these stories to the stories in many respects, the real life circumstances that these folks find themselves in are far more powerful than anything we can say. Yes, absolutely. And if you had to say, you know, one or two of these, if passed, would bring this Well, the first thing is this whole issue about the fact that if you choose to press charges, if a case moves forward, it's very unlikely that the person who beat you up um, will be held until the time that they actually even go to trial is a pretty compelling problem with the current situation. I mean, honestly, you know, I think a lot of people would take a pass on even pressing charges if they thought that the person who did such terrible damage to them under almost no circumstance was going to end up being held um, until trial. I mean, that's a huge disincentive for anybody to move forward under these circumstances. Um, I really believe that's one of the pieces that's got, got to get fixed. And then the second thing, as the lieutenant governor said, is incorporating some of these other areas and circumstances that currently don't apply. The mere fact that in Massachusetts, and we have real life cases like this, cases that have been decided by our Supreme Judicial Court where a prosecutor tried to hold somebody on a dangerousness uh, charge who assaulted a child and the thing went all the way to the SJC, and the SJC said, you know what, you can't do that under current law. Um, we, they basically implied they thought that was a problem. But what they really said was, in the way they worded their decision, but they basically said, you know, under current law, there is no authority to hold this person who sexually assaulted a child for trial. I mean, come on. <laughs> and, the, and the GP, well, you heard a lot about you heard a lot here today about how people misuse um, and remove GPS devices. And, and the fact that our criminal justice system treats these as such a minor inconvenience, when in fact they're a critical piece 
of how we ought to be paying attention to uh, to people who have battered and and bruised and and, and damaged people. It's a pretty clear indicator that that's one that absolutely needs to be changed. <laughs> Correct. Right. right. Yes, you did, Bob. That's exactly right. Right. We spoke specifically to that case when that one popped. Yes. So that's also the same thing. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Can you explain why that's important? This is one that's really important. <laughs> yeah. Lieutenant Governor, I'll let you speak to that one. In that particular case in Danvers, you had a person of trust in the community uh, working in the school district for decades and was discovered uh, to have behind a, a wall after the landlord was doing a plumbing repair a room full of pornography, pictures of children. And for someone who was considered to be a person of trust advising families and children about matters affecting their health and well-being is having a secret life around uh, collecting child pornography. And that this individual is not being held accountable in terms of his uh, threat to other children is atrocious. And it speaks volumes to the problem that the courts have in not having enough tools at their disposal to take an individual like that and to make sure that that person is held until his case is disposed and is behind a wall because that person could definitely uh, threaten the safety and well-being of children known to him or children in a cyber world where those pictures could be used uh, for a business around child pornography that uh, would benefit him, but certainly not the children affected. So there's just one more reason why uh, the, the courts need more tools. This is a common sense uh, approach to fixing a gap that uh, the Supreme Judicial Court said the legislature should fix and that the legislature has the solve and we are using the victim's voices to help make the case that that should be done now. There is urgency behind this. It has to be frustrating then have cases like this pop up that prove the case and then have the inaction. It is extremely frustrating and these are the cases that we know about. You're hearing from individuals that come forward to share their voices. You know of the cases that go before the court and seek out restraining orders. You're not hearing from the thousands of individuals who are in harm's way, who are in abusive homes, who are not able to come forward and tell their story to get a restraining order or to get some protection from the court. So this will go a long way to protecting a lot of people and certainly uh, in Massachusetts, bringing us in par with other states that provide a better public protection system than we do. I just want to emphasize one point the Lieutenant Governor made. I mean, under the current circumstances, how many people do you think don't come forward? Just because um, the deck, as I said in my opening remarks, is not stacked in their direction. Um, so there, there are, I'm sure, many cases that we never hear about. Um, first of all, it's a difficult issue for people to, to bring to the courts or to the law enforcement or even to the social services community because of the very private and difficult um, nature of the, of the incidents that are involved here. But you add to that um, the fact that anybody who sits down with a, um, with a, a, a victim advocate who's going to walk them through how this works and what it means and all the rest. I mean, a lot of folks at that point are just going to say, no thanks, which makes it even worse. Last question. Um, off topic, Governor, <coughs> last week the uh, state court came out with a bad ruling. The report has yep. heard about. Um, called for repairs, but not immediately. And the state doesn't call for a new court. The reaction? Are you going to push for a more of an evaluation of a new courthouse? So I'm not familiar with the court's report on this. Um, what I can tell you is that 
we put a tremendous amount of um, sort of shoulder to the wheel when these issues were first raised with um, DCAM, which is the Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance, and said, you know, you guys need to be full partners with the tenants in that building as well as with the court um, on what needs to be done to deal with it. And right down to taking pictures of all the existing infrastructure and duct work and taking pictures of any repairs that they made, installing air quality monitoring systems to make sure that people, if they were in the building, could be sure that the, the air quality in that building was t being tested on a regular basis, continual regular basis. Um, and we'll certainly do whatever we can to work with the courts uh, to move this forward as quickly as possible. I hadn't, I had not heard that uh, there was some delay in the decision to go forward with the repairs. You're talking about the 2024 for the repairs to really begin? Really? That one's now on my radar. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome, Governor. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Sorry, thank you.